Hi, my name is Roger Barton and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Africa. I was living there from 1970 and I've been working there for many years and uh, I've been visiting the continent for quite a number of years since. Uh, Africa is a very big place and it stretches for about 30,000 square kilometres over uh, about 20% of the Earth's surface, the second largest continent and it has uh, a very young population and about 1.2 billion people. So it's an amazingly big place and you can't sort of uh, say uh, whether one part and compare it to another. Uh, or there's 55 different countries and uh, they extend from the far north where it's virtually uh, desert all the way through to the Sahara and then through Savannah which is a sort of uh, a bushland all the way through to the middle of the continent which is a tropical jungle and it goes further south to more savannah and eventually ends up in the south uh, in the mountainous and desert areas and uh, finishes at Cape Town. I was working in Malawi and Zambia which is uh, in the southeast. This is where I was living in Malawi and this was the next country I was living, which is Zambia, which is the size of France, to give you an idea of the size of the continent. Um, Africa contains lots of problems. Uh, our Prime Minister, just uh, uh, some months ago, stated how he was, he was hosting a, con uh, a conference and said that Africa was one of the chief parts of the world where, where the UK wanted to make uh, investments. Of course, already that's been done many times with the, the, principally the Chinese moving in in large numbers. Uh, and so it's, it's a potentially very valuable continent. It contains an extraordinary number of, uh, of uh, minerals, which almost every other country wants. Uh, it's, it's got a uh, all sorts of, of minerals, bauxite, oil, cobalt, diamonds, phosphate, oh you can go on and on, uranium and uh, of course its agriculture is important as well. But apart from these, one of the things holding Africa back I would probably say is the corruption which goes on. I came across it and I think most people living there would uh, 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 at the same time the Prime Minister was making his proclamation about how valuable uh, Africa is going to be for economic prospects, uh, in Angola, which was is in the West Coast and a big oil producing country, they were changing the presidency and uh, it so happened to be revealed that his daughter had siph apparently siphoned off millions of dollars of oil revenue and uh, was living, one apparently the uh, continent's richest woman, uh, living a high lifestyle. And this is something which goes on, not to that extent all the time, but across many countries. There's an enormous amount of corruption with politicians being uh, uh, having access to uh, large amounts of, of, of money, which they cream off. Uh, and of course, if, if lots of countries used to be an autocracy uh, where it was a, a single person sort of in charge of everything and that was in Malawi in fact when I was there uh, and suddenly democracy is introduced and it's uh, thought well, that's going to be the saviour of the whole uh, country everything's going to improve but it doesn't always happen that way as in happened of course when Zimbabwe be, uh, started after being Rhodesia uh, it had a, a long spiral of going downhill from the breadbasket of Africa to something which was ha, had to accept handouts. 
Um, so lots of problems there. It, not surprising, is a vast country. It can contain the entire uh, area of the USA, China, India, most of Western Europe, including Spain and France and uh, England and Japan, all within its borders. And it's a, so it's, it's an enormous continent and it's got, uh, uh, of course, many problems, which I've sort of indicated. First of all, what was I doing there? I was recruited um, through one of the recruiting agencies, the Overseas Aid Scheme, and uh, I was going out to Malawi to uh, run a, uh, uh, a training scheme in uh, the government printing office in Zomba in Malawi. Uh, I I was there for quite a number of years and I also in that time I worked in Zambia, a similar post introducing um, computerized equipment to the uh, again government printing office. Uh, wife came with me. she was out there and was uh, was working as a nurse for some of the time and uh, and I lived the typical life of an expatriate. Uh, when I first went out there, most people thought, well, where it, I even didn't really know where the country Malawi was. And some people thought, well, this is the last time they'd see me. I was going out sort of a David Livingston style and I was going to disappear uh, into uh, into the jungle. And uh, uh, and to get there, they thought, well, you'd have to negotiate rapids and uh, jungle trails to get there. And when I explained, well, there's an, a weekly flight which goes out from uh, the UK and uh, uh, and it's a, a regular uh, weekly occurrence uh, that they're somewhat uh, surprised but of course uh, that was back in the old days and things have, have changed a lot since then. Um, I should say something about the uh, the weather. One of the chief things about Africa is the amount of rainfall it gets. Uh, it's important because most of the population, 80% in fact, are uh, in the rural areas and rely upon agriculture as a means of production. Uh, the rains in the uh, in the uh, savannah region where, where I was, which contains Kenya, Malawi and Zambia and um, perhaps over the other side, that's on the west uh, eastern side and on the west side is Angola as well and these countries have uh, a tremendous amount of rain in the from where the dry season starts from uh, all the way through the year and finishes in about October or November when the rains start and they produce phenomenal amounts of of rain but it comes in a huge deluge uh, occurring every uh, more or less regulars clockwork uh, every day and the rains come down in, in a devastating show of force with thunderstorms uh, and uh, lightning and uh, uh, the, the, the streams fill up rapidly overflow bridges are washed away uh, landslides uh, it's an incredible sight to see the, the amount of rain it can fall within perhaps just an hour and and you can hear the rain coming. It, 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 you hear it like a sound of a thousand rustling leaves as it hits the banana trees and all the agriculture and, uh, and it finally descends upon you in its devastating force. Uh, 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 after uh, perhaps about an hour, it moves on and the, the clouds, which were darkened the sky, which was blue and suddenly got dark, uh, change back to blue again and you tend to think well that, that's over and uh, everything gets back to normal you see the land outside where the um where there's a sort of stony ground the the um uh ground is chiseled away by the uh force of the water and it's rather like a sort of miniature Grand Canyon with stones piled up maybe five centimetres high on uh, a, a, on a mound of earth where the stone is on top and the rain is just washed away everything else leaving these stones perched up there. Uh, th this is a signal for all sorts of insects to appear and insects that come 
with uh, surprising uh, regularity or they're almost waiting for the rains uh, and I, I've written a book about this called waiting for the rains uh, which is really about what life is like living in Africa and uh, 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 and I'll show you this I have another book called um, incident at Barbie's Ridge which is about a conflict which goes on there the first my first book is uh, uh, an autobiography and the second book is about a minor conflict which goes on and how uh, between the two sides, the settlers and the indigenous people, and and both got a a legitimate uh, uh, need for the land, uh, and and both lay claim to it. That's how the situation is resolved. Um, and so, uh, uh, it's a, an interesting continent. Uh, very few people. To, tend to go there. Ones that do tend to go to uh, the um, game reserves, of course, and the beach resorts. The number of people that actually go inland into the interior of Africa is quite low. Uh, the, uh, I was there uh, three to four years ago, and in that time I noticed that uh, I travelled all the way up and down the Coast, the, the land of the country of Malawi and the only uh, tourists I saw were some gap year students on one of the lake, lake steamers and they were uh, a handful of them I didn't see any others in all the time I was there uh, except uh, perhaps in the towns of course but traveling I didn't see any other uh, people from outside uh, which is a great shame but not surprising that it's very difficult to travel if you're going to go in a in a bus or a a, 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 a party of tourists you're rather cocooned and don't meet the local people and you're going to africa to see something new and something different and uh, i think you want to go there uh it takes a little bit of um ingenuity but uh, and a learning curve as to how to get around but the to travel by local bus uh, and uh, trains uh, is uh, quite a, a, a daunting experience and uh, only for the hardened uh, travellers so it's not surprising that you don't see too many tourists around um, uh, which brings me to perhaps the, the next point is, is the sort of roads that you can expect there 80 percent of the roads in Africa are actually uh, uh, unpaved they don't have a hard covering and half a lot of the roads which do have a covering are so broken down by the constant um, battering of the weather and the transport that they've become lots of potholes and uh, have uh, you know, enormous amounts of um, makeup needed on them but I'm afraid it doesn't always get done and, and so in the winter in in the uh, rainy season they turn into a sea of mud and you often see vehicles scattered each side of the road in just can't get through until uh, they get pushed out or something of that sort uh, and in the dry season they turn into a sea of sand and uh, and of course that makes almost another difficult passage through so roads are uh, and uh, uh, something different bridges are sometimes very hazardous places to cross because um, uh, they often get sort of washed away there isn't any bridge or if there is it's been repaired it's a hazardous form uh, to get away i travel a lot uh, in all sorts of transport uh, around and maybe i should mention perhaps how traveling is a hazardous business um it's uh I remember being on several buses uh, and they leave uh, uh, only when they're full. Uh, luggage is on top, inside, there's all sorts of things brought on board, old scrap iron, chickens, live animals running up and down. Uh, you sometimes can't get on to a bus until you actually go uh, climb up on through the windows because you can't get in through the doors or uh, and you've got your luggage if and, and always travel light your luggage is probably strapped onto the roof and so uh, 
it's it's quite a hazardous uh, form of getting around but it can be enjoyable when you get used to it uh, i remember being on a bus when, when a part fell off at night and uh, they asked for people with a torch which happened to be me uh, to get out and see if they get along the road behind as to whether in fact uh, uh, the part which fell off could be found there was a group of people of us we were searching the road behind the bus to try and find the part it didn't get found and so the driver uh, just went on with just it, apparently it was something like an alternator or something they just went on uh, with his uh, uh, side lights on uh, quite, quite a hazardous thing but quite usual because a lot of vehicles perhaps don't use the lights if they've got any they're not they're not always used so yeah traveling around uh, uh, and the, the, there's large large buses which are probably the safer ones to be on uh, uh, and they only leave when they're full and so uh, the timetables are irregular there's not a number 20 bus leaving from stand uh, 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 25 at a quarter past 10 it'll only leave when there's enough people to fill it up and uh and it gets on its way uh, and sometimes especially the mini bus is a very hazardous thing so they, they travel at breakneck speed often overloaded with drivers intent on almost a suicide mission to get to the end of the route so that they can turn around and get their way back again uh, almost all they are of course taxes as well uh, and so uh, there's a maelstrom of different ways of getting around uh, one other thing perhaps i should mention here is um on um, lake malawi is some uh, is, is, is a very large water-based uh, 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 uh freshwater lake uh, which extends all the way up the country and there's a lake steamer which goes all the way up and down when i went to and i'll there will be some photos of this and when i tried to get on the steamer the uh, this little boat ferrying from the shore to the to the uh, uh steamer which is anchored you couldn't because there was no ferry you had to wade out into the lake in, with your bag to get on one of the small um uh little motor almost like rowing boats and when you got up the other end it was there's no way to get on except a rope ladder over the side to a hole in the side which is like a porthole and uh, you climbed up this being pushed from behind if you couldn't sort of make it and uh, you entered into the side of the uh, of a vessel uh, as, as best you could meanwhile uh, uh, there's no such thing as freight uh, 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 contain freight containers they are all put in by um, being ferried out in these little boats sheet metal banana trees uh, uh packages uh of goods meant for the local village bicycles motorcycles everything went on board no matter how big as long as it could go if it couldn't go in through that hole in the side where passengers went in it would be hauled up over the side and stacked on deck and uh uh and, and when again when it was ready the, the uh it, it went up the lake so uh, then of course there's trains trains uh, um, in some parts of the country but the most popular form of getting around will be uh, uh, by bus uh, of large scale buses or mini buses uh, which ply between the, all, all the rural areas some of the rural areas and of course in between there's there are some long distance luxury buses which go between the large cities but for them for the rest it's all that goes uh via the uh, uh mini buses in between local towns and so okay that that is the perhaps the the the, the, the way of, of of getting around and i'll i'll cover a bit more uh as as uh uh in, in the next part of the of the talk here I want to conclude the first part of my talk on Africa by looking at the uh, lives of expatriates and the kind of people who get to be recruited to live in and work for quite long periods of time in fairly remote areas. 
Um, it's on usually on a contract basis, uh, so you sign up for uh, anywhere between usually two to three years. And the interview procedure is quite lengthy, especially in the early days when going out to places uh, was they were more remote than what they are today. But that's the same. They are quite a long way away and the uh, commitment has to be made to make sure the, the people can stand living away from their family and friends and the home environment for what can be quite long periods of time. Uh, some expatriates are continually on the move. It's a sort of way of life. They move from one country to another and never uh, uh, really go home except on, on brief rest periods. Um, uh, but it's, it's, it tends to be quite a comfortable life. Uh, the, the housing and everything, all creature comforts are taken care of and uh, and so it uh, leaves a lot of time for socialising. There is a lot of socialising that takes place uh, in expatriates. They're often centred around the, uh, the, the name of the colonial club uh, is quite popular. And wherever expatriates are, there is usually a, a club of some sort which uh, they belong to. In the old days, it was very exclusive and only expats were uh, could ever join but now of course it's open to uh, anyone who uh, has got the money to be able to afford to join these places uh, it often means that uh, being expatriate means that you are away from uh, you, you, uh, the family and life that you knew back in your home country for some it can be a disruption it, it may uh, maybe a gloss to it when it starts uh, the, the sun and the easy lifestyle uh, lots of parties and uh, lots of socializing but it can mean without the restrictions and the social cohesion which is uh, perhaps more prevalent in home countries it would mean that some do go off the rails We're often um, taking to drink there's often a, a lax uh, so social conditions mean that uh, uh, very often wives who come out very uh, there's many cases where they, they can't stand the isolation and uh, give up and, you know, and go back uh, after a year or two in, in cases like this uh, the, the men who are left behind can take off with the local girls who are from the, the local village or uh, lead a, a very uh, disrupted lifestyle this does happen and uh, I saw many instances of, of, of breakups like this uh, it's to get out of a contract is very difficult you don't necessarily uh, just uh, say well I'm leaving next week there, there is a, a, a if, if you break a contract there's usually heavy financial penalties and uh, it's not something that can be done lightly when there's children involved, um, uh, very often one of the uh, the cream on the icing of the of the uh, the, the contract terms means that they can often uh, go to exclusive uh, private schools, which are part paid for by the uh, authorities who do the recruiting, and the children come out uh, uh, on. Uh, flights in the old days where when there was more expatriates than there are now it often meant that the uh, children would uh, come in, out as a group uh, on what sometimes called lollipop flights uh, whole planes full of sort of children coming out for the school holidays for the summer uh, and uh, to join their parents uh, who were in a distant African country and then go back to their uh, to the school in their home country, a boarding school, and this was considered to be one of the perks of the job. It did mean that, as you can see, the isolation from family and friends it was quite a factor, and it, uh, some people can live with this, and some have great difficulty making adjustments to this kind of life. 
uh, in the early days uh, when uh, expatriates could very often go so-called up country into remote areas they would often quite bizarre situations where they would take all their finery and their dress suits and in uh, uh, and uh, at the nighttime meal outside the tent they would dress up and have white tablecloths and silver for platters uh, in an attempt to prevent what was known as going bush uh, where, where the disintegration into local lifestyle would be disastrous and, uh, uh, and, and, and dressing up and trying to uh, have all the protocols of a, of a civilised life were taken on to prevent a disintegration into a sort of a, uh, a remote lifestyle. Uh, especially in the early, when, when I first went out, I knew expatriates, some of them were on uh, very lengthy contracts, in fact not in the, they, they were per, pensionable posts and they were there as, as a permanent job. And I remember uh, a rather elderly person who was there, soon to retire, can remember going between uh, the two principal towns in Malawi uh, on a stagecoach and one of them would ride shotgun in, in order to uh, uh, prevent attacks by lions. It, it, it does reminiscent of the old West days, but they, and this, this wouldn't be so very long ago, probably in the uh, sort of uh, 1930s or 40s, uh, a, a situation like this did occur. Uh, there are also lots of uh, missionaries, who are there on a permanent basis, and and they are often in remote areas. They do lots of good work, run missions, run hospitals, and are well respected. And are well, they do welcome uh, people to stop with them when they're when they're travelling by. I, I tend to remember a story of uh, and staying in one of the uh, missions, and the uh, uh, he, he told me a story about he used to have a. Uh, uh, a pet boar that was black with uh, sort of piercing eyes and uh, it, as it got older it, it got so so big he had to write he used to sleep on his bed he used to raise the bed up on blocks in order to accommodate him and apparently used to run around the mission hospital and scare the life out of the people who were uh, queuing up for uh, uh, medical treatment and uh, Apparently, this was one of the tales of uh, living with this wild boar, which he uh, apparently was was quite true and something which uh, uh, was he would keep you amused for hours with tales like this. And and so, this is the kind of lifestyle these expatriates uh, 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 had to accommodate, and uh, many of them went on to be serial. Uh, uh, expats going from place to place uh, and, but of course over the years as localization programs have uh, taken hold it's very there's very few expatriates around now and and and, and the ones that are running large organizations uh, in, in the capital city uh, uh, very much in the same way and a similar style of life perhaps what they would have in their home country. Uh, so the lifestyles of expatriates has changed over the years and they tend to get uh, fewer of them as the localization programs go ahead. So an interesting life and one which I was uh, uh, destined to lead for a good many years. I I've, I've hope you enjoyed this uh, uh, chat and, uh, and I'll come back to you in a, at a later time. Uh, perhaps to continue with uh, more reminiscences. Okay, thanks for listening.